So today's webinar is titled Linking Metabolomics to Diseases Using Human Genetics, a CLSA study. This webinar will be presented by Yinghen Chen, Chen, PhD candidate in the Department of Human Genetics at McGill University, who is under the supervision of Professors Brett Richards and Celia Greenwood. His research focuses on understanding the interplay between metabolites <clears throat> and diseases using gen genomics approaches. He is also interested in the impact of sex on the genetic variant metabolite associations. Okay, so now I will turn it over to you. And um, yeah, and thanks everyone um, for your presentation of my webinar. And thanks for CLSA to uh, for giving me this opportunity to present my work um, on the metabolomics and genetics. So the, today's talk will be centered around this study uh, entitled Genomic Atlas of the Plasma Metabolome Prioritizes Metabolites Implicated in Human Diseases. So um, specifically, I will talk about uh, the general background relate to metabolites and diseases, and briefly describe the method that were used in this study and the data set that were used. And then I will talk about the details for this research study, uh, including the research aims, designs, results, and conclusion. Uh, let's start with the background information. So let's start with the main focus of the study, metabolites. So what are metabolites? So metabolites are small molecules that either the intermediate or the end product of uh, in the metabolic reactions. Um, and the definition shows depending on their uh, chemical features or uh, biological function, they can be uh, usually grouped into like categories such as uh, lipids, amino acid, carbohydrates, vitamins, energy substrates, nucleotides, um, xenobiotics, and more. Um, they are important because they are involved in the essential biological process in the organisms and contribute to the development of numerous phenotypes. Uh, some well-known metabolites include uh, like glucose and fructose from candy, like caffeine from coffee, and vitamin C uh, from the fruits. So many factors can influence metabolites. Um, genetics is one of the major endogenous uh, contributors. So genetic variants, um, they can influence the transcriminal levels and also protein levels. And those proteins, especially those um, enzyme transporters uh, directly metabolize the metabolites, uh, play a key role that regulate the levels of metabolites either in the circulating system or in specific tissues. Um, exogenous factors like food, uh, drugs, or environmental factors like so even sun exposure, they can also influence metabolite levels. Uh, lastly, the gut bacteria um, have been found to, uh, you know, they can further metabolize the, the food or uh, those reach the gut and the produce metabolites which can be reobserved by human body and influence metabolic levels. So then the next question is how a metabolite measured? So, um, so one technique that widely used is called high performance liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, HPLC, LC, MS. This is a technique that can measure uh, hundreds of thousands of metabolites at the same time and is also the one uh, chosen by CLSA to measure the metabolites. So in brief, so the blood samples or blood plasma samples first go through this uh, HPOC step for chemical separation. And then the separated chemicals will be uh, ionized and detected by the MS part. So then the mass spectrometry or the uh, spectrum generated by mass spec uh, can be used to um, identify or and quantify those metabolites, such as cholesterol and glycine. So as I mentioned, uh, this technique can measure over 1,000 metabolites simultaneously. 
So to um, the next question is, why do we need to study metabolites? Uh, why do we need to spend so much effort to, you know, collect samples and develop those tools to measure metabolic levels? Um, part I already part partially mentioned uh, that one of the reasons is that those metabolites, they are essential for the metabolic process in the human body. And they also contribute to the develop development of the phenotypes. Um, additionally, uh, studies have, have found the association between those metabolites and many disease, many diseases, such as branched, uh, branched chain amino acids with obesity, uh, saturated fatty acids with liver disease, some bioacid with uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, infection in lung, some bioacid were uh, explored as the treatment. And lastly, cholesterol with coronary heart disease. So those associations has been found in the animal models and also in uh, cohort studies uh, from human. But this still, those association found is still uh, many steps away from the real clinical practice. And it's partially because of two major challenges. Uh, one is called reverse causation, and the second one is called confounding. And we'll explain those two concepts in detail here. So in, uh, for example, if we find a metabolite that is associated with you know, increased risk for obesity, uh, there is also a possibility that this association observed that those um, you know, higher level of the metabolites uh, in obese individuals is could it because of the obesity itself led to the changes on metabolites instead of, you know, this metabolite increase occurred before the obesity because obesity as a physiological change, it comes with a lot of, for example, more adipose tissue, more adipose adipocytes, and those changes can lead to uh, an alteration in metabolism too, which can lead to changes in metabolic levels. So that's the, uh, the challenge for reverse causation. Another challenge confounding um, is in this example, we found metabolites to be associated with cardiovascular disease. We also know that obesity as is also an important factor that could influence both cardiovascular disease and metabolites. So it is a confounder. So if that's the case, then the association we observed between the metabolite and cardiovascular disease is just occurred just because of obesity, not because these metabolites have any direct effect on cardiovascular disease. So that's a situation or challenge uh, called confounding. So then how can we you know, address those challenges? That will lead to the methods I'm going to talk about. So um, one or the golden standard to solve or address those challenges is randomized study. So um, a general design for randomized control trial include when uh, eligible participants got recruited, they will be randomized, um, uh, randomly assigned to two arms, the intervention arm and the placebo arm or the control arm. So here I'm using vitamin D and multiple sclerosis as an example. So if we want to study whether given people uh, vitamin D supplements can reduce the risk for multiple sclerosis, we can you know, design this randomized controlled trial and give the interventional arm, the people in the interventional arm, the supplement of vitamin D, and which can lead to increased uh, serum level of vitamin D. And in the control group, we just give them placebo and their vitamin D level will be uh, will remain uh, the same. So then we, after follow up them for many years, we will see whether the incidence of multiple sclerosis is higher or you know the same between those two arms. The advantage of randomized control trial in brief, of course, there's a lot more advantage, but specifically for the two challenges I brought up, is they can reduce the bias related to the confounding by the randomization step. So if we think obesity could be the confounder, by randomization, the intervention group and the control group will have 
equal number or like highly similar number of, you know, uh, of BMI or obese individuals to make obesity not uh, less or unlikely to influence the different incidents we may observe for the multiple sclerosis. Another advantage for randomized control trial is that we are sure that intervention, like the supplementation of vitamin D, happens before the incidence of multiple sclerosis. So the timeline is very clear, which avoid reverse causation um, issue. Of course, uh, randomized control trial have some limitations, such as they're costly. It usually um, require long duration to see enough or to get enough cases uh, for the comparison. And also sometimes it's unethical uh, to test the potentially harm uh, or harmful intervention. For example, if we want to know the causal effect of saturated fatty acids, we cannot give people you know, saturated fatty acids uh, directly um, if we know it's really a harmful. So um, yeah, so then some scientists come up with this uh, new genetic epidemiological approach. Uh, when I say new, it has been there for um, at least 10 years, but it's um, become quite popular for the past uh, five years because of availability of the data. So this method is called um, Mendelian randomization. So uh, I will call it MR for the rest of my talk. So basically, MR is a genetic um, epidemiology approach where we try to uh, mimic the design of a randomized control trial. So similarly, in the MR study, we have the population. We assume that the leos of the genetic variant were randomly assigned. So that led to two groups. The group, for example, have the G allele, which we know it associated with higher uh, level of vitamin D, and another group of individuals with CLEO where uh, their vitamin D level is lower or which like similar to no change. And then by checking the incidence um, of the disease uh, within those two groups that have different alleles of this genetic variants, um, more specifically, we are checking whether the GLEO is also associated with the risk for multiple sclerosis, we can infer the effect of our exposure, vitamin D level, and the outcome, multiple sclerosis risk. So actually this study, uh, the MR study has been done to investigate the vitamin D effect on uh, risk of multiple sclerosis. So this study has been published on PLOS Medicine. So in this forest plot, I'm showing you the effect of single genetic variant, there's four, uh, of um, on the, the their effect on the um, uh, through the exposure, which is vitamin D, on the risk for multiple sclerosis, as well as also there is a meta-analysis result. So here I'm showing uh, here it shows the per standard deviation decrease of the vitamin D level. We observe the higher risk for multiple sclerosis, so which um, kind of support the conclusion that the you know vitamin D is causal for um, multiple, multiple sclerosis risk, especially uh, for those individuals with lower than average vitamin D levels, they have high risk. So there are three uh, key assumptions for uh, MR study. So the first assumption is that the genetic variant, uh, they are associated with our exposure. In, uh, in my case here is metabolites. And the second assumption um, is that the genetic variants are not associated with the confounder of uh, exposure and outcome. And lastly, the genetic variants only associate with the outcome through the exposure. With those three assumptions, we can use the genetic associations between the variant and exposures as instrument variable to infer the causal effect um, of exposure on outcomes, such as metabolized to uh, disease risk. So just to uh, summarize this uh, method, 
So uh, MR kind of uses measured variation in genes of known phenotypes to examine the causal effect of a modifiable exposure, um, such as vitamin D, on disease such as multiple sclerosis. So the advantages of you know, MR, uh, especially to address those two challenges, um, are so they can avoid confounding uh, by simulating the randomization process. So according to the Mendel second law, the independent assortment, so alleles, will be um, sorted into gametes independently and randomly. So which means the individual who carry the G allele, as I mentioned, that increase or led to higher level of vitamin D, they, they should be um, similar in terms of their potential confounders or other features as those carry C alleles. So the confounders should be, you know, evenly distributed in those two subcohort. So another advantage is that it can avoid reverse causation uh, is partially because um, genetic function, they usually happened before the occurrence of the disease. So the genera genetic variants, um, since we know they're related to metabolites, they are also near the gene that encode uh, an enzyme or transporter for vitamin D. Um, they are likely to first influence the vitamin D levels, uh, then influencing uh, the disease outcomes. So uh, one missing part I didn't mention when I describe MR is how can we find the association between the specific Leo of the variant with either um, the vitamin D levels and with the risk for multiple sclerosis. So to find those, find those associations, we perform a, a type of analysis um, called genome-wide association studies. So for example, for vitamin D, we have a uh, group of people, we uh, recruit them, we uh, genotype their genotypes, and we also measure the vitamin D levels. Then we can check the association between all the, uh, all the vaginal variants and uh, in those and the specific leos of those variants, and whether the dosage of specific leo is associated with, uh, you know, maybe higher or uh, lower level of vitamin D. And here is just one example of a positive association between the G leo and vitamin D levels. As for the case control uh, or for diseases, uh, we usually have you know a cohort with both cases and controls. And then we check whether specific leos at a variant are more uh, frequent in the case group than the control group. Then that observation can lead to the identification of the association between this uh, leo at this variant and the disease liability. So using GWAS, we can find the association between the genetic variants with metabolites and with disease risks. So that conclude the two methods I used in my study. So um, lastly, uh, for this introduction, I will uh, talk about the data I used. So I think everyone here knows what is um, COSA. So basically, um, COSA recruit over 50,000 individuals um, to uh, you know, collect their information for research use. And um, specifically, they have this comprehensive uh, cohort, which have about 30,000 individuals. They get more uh, data from those individuals. They also collect, uh, they collect their blood samples, they also, um, the urine samples, and measured, um, you know, metabolized and genotype data using those uh, biological samples. So uh, one important um, consideration when we try to use this uh, comprehensive cohort is that this cohort is more educated, that have uh, generally higher household income, that more Canadian born and usually have better general health compared to the general population of Canada. So uh, a bit more detail about this comprehensive cohort. Uh, so their clinical um, 
phenotypes such as you know body mass index, disease risk, or oh, sorry, disease um, uh, prevalence uh, has been collected. Their socioeconomic status um, data were, uh, were also collected. Lifestyle behavior data were also collected, and um, importantly, they have their genotype data um, uh, collected and also imputed for use. Uh, for metabolites, um, about 9,500 individuals a month uh, from this comprehensive cohort, uh, you know, have the metabolomics data. And by the HL, uh, sorry, HPOC uh, MS technique, over um, 1,300 metabolites were measured by um, this company called Metabolome. Uh, a few more words about the genomic data. Um, so, uh, so being specifically uh, for this comprehensive cohort, about um, 26,000 individuals have uh, genomic data, 50% are uh, females, 93% uh, were identified or, uh, as uh, European ancestry individuals. Uh, genotyping step, they measured about 800,000 variants, and then those genotyped variants were imputed using the TopMed reference panel to uh, which can lead to identification of over 300 million uh, genetic variants that can be used for genetic research. Uh, for metabolic or for metabolomics data, so the EDTA plasma samples were sent to the company for them to measure the metabol levels. So as I mentioned, the metabolome, they used this um, HPOC MS technique. So they measured um, 13, uh, 14 biochemicals, uh, include uh, 1,071 compounds with known identity. So they can, based on the mass spectrum, they can uh, they know what chemical those compounds were uh, uh, are. And they also have about 243 compounds that they can separate, but they just cannot map them to any known uh, structures. So there's those metabolites are unnamed biochemicals and usually categorized as like partially characterized or unknown metabolites by, in the data uh, provided by metabolome. So, so for the metabolomics data, um, metabolome provided um, the data after different normalization and imputation steps. So the data after batch normalization or QC matrix normalization uh, has been provided. So both approach is aims to address the potential batch effect um, with the measurement table levels. So then data without or with imputed values uh, with minimum um, values detected for the given metabolites were both uh, provided. Um, because some metabolites they could have um, relatively low abundance in the plasma, so it could be um, below the detection limit, and then um, the data, you know, imputed values based on the minimum values for the metabolites were provided for those metabolites. So finally, we reach to uh, the part I would talk about. Um, the research aims, design, and results and collusion for my uh, research project. So for this project, I have two aims. The first aim is I try to identify the genetic determinants for circulat circulating metabolites using GWAS. And uh, second aim is using the association I identified between variant and metabolites, I then applied MR to infer the cause and effect of those metabolites on 12 traits and diseases. So let's start with the M1, so the GWAS part. So for the GWAS, um, I performed the GWAS, uh, separate GWAS for each metabolite and also some metabolic ratios. I used up to uh, 2, 000, uh, 8,299 unrelated individuals in European ancestry from the CSA cohort. I surveyed 1,091 metabolites that present in over 50% of the individuals, and also 309 metabolite ratios. So after GWAS, I will have 
you know, the association between all the genetic variants and the metabolites. Then to identify those um, conditional independent genome-wide significant associations for the metabolites and metabolic ratios, I performed this conditional and joint analysis to um, identify the leading uh, variant or the leading um, association for uh, for the variant and the metabolites in each uh, genetic regions. So here I'm showing a uh, Manhattan plot. So um, by performing GWAS for metabolites, I identified 1,702 independent variant metabolite associations from uh, 600, uh, 690 metabolites. And they come from um, about 248 loci or genetic regions. And that's what's showing in this Manhattan plot. So the X axis for this plot is a chromosome and the different genetic positions. And the Y axis just showing the p-value or negative log 10 transform the p-value uh, for the association between the genetic variant and metabolites. So each line of the dots is actually a locus. So all those association happens in this specific or uh, you know chosen uh, genetic regions. And each dot is a variant metabolite associations. So for example, for this locus, we can see uh, many genetic variant in this locus associated with uh, some amino acids, which indicated by the color of the dot and some lipids. And from this plot, the key message is that we find the association between variants from all the autosomes with many, many different types of metabolites. And those metabolites come from different categories, um, which kind of uh, one advantage of those um, metabolomics measurement uh, approach, because we can simultaneously check the association with many different types of metabolites. So um, the second part uh, I'm trying to show here is I um, explored the novelty of the association I found, as well as the general heritability of the metabolite levels. So on the left panel, um, you can see this is the number of known or novel associations for different metabolites um, under or belonging to different categories of metabolites um, as uh, shown in the x-axis. And the y-axis is just the counts for the association for that, uh, for those metabolites. And the dark blue one, uh, those, uh, uh, I think is known association. And the light blue one are those novel association identified in the current study. Um, so for example, for lipids, we find about 150 novel association and another 150 no association that have been reported in the literature. And interestingly, we also found, you know, uh, maybe 100 metabolites, they do not have um, uh, the association, sorry, some uh, lipids that do not have significant associations identified in this study. And this kind of the light green part, which is for the metabolite without significant associations with genetic variants seems to be have a higher proportion for xenobiotics, which are the metabolites that usually you obtain from exogenous source, uh, such as food or medicine. So um, here on the right, right panel, I'm showing you the heritability estimated for uh, different metabolites. And this is a volume plot on the x-axis, just the categories of you know the metabolites, and y-axis just the estimate heritability. So in general, we find around um, like twenty percent of the variants um, of um, metabolites can be explained by genetics. That's the median heritability, and for some categories of metabolites like xenobiotics or peptide. Their medium um, heritability is lower compared to others, 
whereas cofactors and vitamins and nucleotides, they seem to have higher medium heritability. So um, last feature uh, related to genetic architecture, or last two features related to genetic architecture, I want to talk about here is polygenicity and pleiotropy. So uh, polygenicity is about the number of loci associated with each metabolites. So it basically saying, you know, whether this metabolite is only determined by one or two loci, or they can they are influenced by many, many different uh, genes. Um, and so that's something try to reflect or try to be reflected by the polygenicity. And in this uh, panel here, we can see uh, that, so the x-axis is the number of loci associated with associated per metabolite, and y-axis is the heritability estimated for that corresponding uh, metabolites. So each dot is a metabolite. So we can see most of the, I wouldn't say most, but a majority of the metabolites, they have fewer than two uh, loci. As we can see, most dots is for here. Um, so which means the polygenicity of from metabolites, at least based on the evidence from the current study, is moderate or is not a super, or in other words, metabolites are not very polygenic. And we can also see this positive correlation between the number of loci for metabolites and the heritability. So which um, just showing that the more polygenic the metabolites are, usually their heritability, heritability is higher. Uh, then for the pleiotropy uh, feature, so pleiotropy is a measure about how many metabolites are associated with each locus. So um, on the x-axis for this plot here, I'm it's accumulated percentage um, x. Um, so basically, we are showing, for example, here, uh, about 50% of the locus or loci, they associate with fewer than three metabolites. That's how we uh, read this plot. And interestingly, there are some locus that associate with up to 79 metabolites. So in that case, the gene for that locus, um, they could be a hot gene for some, for many metabolic process and influence many metabolites. It could, you know, worth for further exploration for, you know, how that gene, you know, involved in um, the metabolism of those metabolites and how can we use, you know, targeting that gene for those process. So uh, that's finished uh, the part related to the metabolite GWAS. Here I'm showing the, re the results for metabolite ratios uh, GWAS. So um, how the metabolite ratio were constructed. So that's the this part. We, are sh uh, we first identified the metabolites that share enzyme or transporter. And then for those uh, metabolite pairs, we construct a ratio. And then using the ratio um, as the, um, the trait or as the phenotype for GWAS. Um, so the reason why we're doing or constructing the metabolite ratio, the first is because um, by constructing the ratio, we can reduce the variance of the, the measurements and uh, increase, the sorry, increase the statistical power. And secondly, those metabolic ratio uh, associations may help us capture some metabolic reactions. You know, for example, uh, maybe there's some variant for this enzyme or transporter that really led to this uh, variation of metabolic ratio uh, in the population. That's something we want to uh, discover. And on the panel B here, uh, I'm showing the uh, association we identified between uh, different metabolite pairs. So um, each band on the, for the circular plot, plot, each band is one metabolite for the corresponding uh, categories. And each line, the link to metabolites is just for the two metabolites uh, for this metabolite ratio. 
So um, and the darkness of the filling color of this line indicate how strong the association are. So we can see that for, for lipids and amino acids, there are a lot of um, association for metabolic ratios, uh, but they are kind of more, seems to be within their categories. Whereas for energy substrates, we find genetic variants that contribute to the ratio between genetic variants, sorry, energy substrates, and many different types of metabolites, which somehow uh, I think is um, quite met our expectation as many different reactions that involving uh, different metabolites, they usually need this uh, energy substrates. So uh, by running the GUS for metabolic ratios, we identified 16 additional associations that were not or, uh, or were not captured by single metabolite GUS. Uh, here I'm just showing one example. So uh, we found uh, this RS247227 uh, variant is associated with the ratio for caffeine and pyrethrin. So, and from the literature, we know that um, parathyrin is just one of the derivative of caffeine. And we also find the closest gene for this genetic variant is actually the enzyme that catalyzes this process. So, which kind of supporting, um, you know, our, uh, when we, our attention to um, conduct this metabolic ratio GUS or supporting the value of conducting metabolic ratio GUS. Um, based on those variant metabolic associations or variant metabolic ratio associations, uh, we next we tried to identify the effector genes that mediated the effect of variant on the metabolites. So specifically, we um, identified the protein coding genes that near this variant, and then we checked whether this variant also influenced the transcript level which is EQTL, or splicing variant of the uh, gene, uh, which is SQTL uh, first. And then we checked whether this corresponding gene are uh, known to, to be involved in the metabolism of the metabolites uh, by checking the HMDB, KEG, and PubChem databases. So uh, by combining those, those information, we um, we kind of get uh, or refine a list of potential effector genes that are uh, you know, more likely to be uh, relevant for this variant to metabolic associations. So the expression related uh, relevant genes led to um, include about uh, 550 genes and the biological relevant uh, check identified about 250 genes. And the overlap part is 94, which is our effector genes. And most of those effector genes are enzymes, and another 7.4% of them are transporters. And of course, there are some other uh, proteins, like uh, some binding proteins and circulating proteins that are part of the, or um, were found to be the effector genes for the barium and tablet associations we found. So um, lastly, to see if these effector genes are implicated in any phenotypes and if they can be used as drug targets, we explored the linkage of those effector genes with the drugs um, and uh, the phenotype changes in knockout mice and also human Mendelian uh, traits or disease. So by checking the overlap part, we find 14 effector genes that are all um, have all three sources of information. They are listed here. And these connections may help us um, identify the metabolites that you know, can be used as the biomarkers for the related disease. Or maybe we can use um, repurpose those drugs that link to those effector genes uh, to modulate the level of the corresponding metabolites or associated with traits. So that concludes the uh, results for the M1 part. 
And here, then we conduct analysis to uh, identify the potential cause of metabolites for Tourism disease um, using MR approach. So here is the general design for the MR analysis in this study. So for the exposure, we focused on those metabolite and metabolite ratios that have um, effector genes identified. Then for the outcomes, we focused on 12 trees from uh, three categories. Um, they are either aging-related traits, such as bone mineral density, um, or uh, metabolism-related traits, that body mass index, um, and also some immune-responsive uh, related traits, such as um, asthma. Then with exposure and outcome, we perform the two-sample MR analysis and identify the uh, cause of metabolites and ratios for those outcomes. Uh, but for any corrected p-value, or thresholds were used to prioritize the associations and sensitivity analysis like uh, metabolic pleiotropy check, reverse MR, as well as MR result prioritization analysis as colocalization were performed to uh, prioritize the more likely or more um, the, the, the cause of metabolites for the disease or trace tested. So here I'm just quickly show you uh, the metabolites that we found for the aging related traits. Uh, it's not for you to see the details. I will talk about two representative examples uh, later, but here just to show um, by MR approach, we find many metabolites that are related to aging traits, relate to metabolism related traits and disease, uh, uh, and also related to immune related traits and diseases. So the two example I want to uh, discuss more here, one is the rotate with estimated bone mineral density. So through MR, we find that the increasing uh, level, uh, genetic predictor level of rotate is associated with uh, lower estimated bone mineral density. And this in, is interesting because using an uh, independent cohort, we found that the higher level of rotate is associated with higher risk for heat fracture. So this is consistent with our MR results, um, where we're like both of those results suggesting that you know the increased level of rotate is somehow involved in the impairment of uh, bone health. Another example is alpha hydroxyaloverate. Um, so from the MR, we found that the increasing um, genetic predictor level of this metabolite associated with decreased BMI. Um, interestingly, we found the effector gene for this uh, va uh, variant metabolite association is called lactate dehydrogenase, LDH. A. Um, and this gene, if we knock it out in the mouse model, those heterozygous mass have decreased total fat mount, uh, which is kind of um, consistent with our observation that this metabolites is, could be the mediator of the genetic effect on the obesity or atherometric traits. Uh, lastly, um, since we know many disease and traits, they are also, they can also be influenced by obesity. Um, try, we, here we try to uh, perform analysis to differentiate the effect that uh, whether our metabolites influence the outcome such as asthma and, and BMD through the BMI, or they just, they can influence them independently. So this is the called approach uh, GWAS by subtraction, which allowed us to uh, differentiate or dissect the gene genetic effect on the uh, BMI dependent part and BMI independent part um, on those outcomes, on the disease outcomes or trait outcomes. So um, here, uh, MR, then with those uh, uh, association, um, we can we perform the MR again. And we found, for example, 
uh, the orotate for orotate, the association with BMD is mostly through the um, in uh, the part that independent from BMI. In another example for citrulline, we find the uh, relate to the um, asthma, but at least it's partially its effect is partially um, through uh, influencing the BMI. So um, there are some limitations of the study. For example, most of available, uh, available disease and trade GWAS are from uh, individuals in European ancestry. And this can limit the general stability of our finding to the non-European uh, population. Uh, and secondly, the metabolomics data are relative measurements. So the finding we have, for example, we found this higher level of uh, oral rotate associated with lower HBMD, is we don't um, really know what exact level that higher level uh, is. And it's uh, to really apply those uh, users' metabolic clinical practice, we need to uh, additional experiments to really quantify the absolute measurement of those metabolites uh, in the blood. And lastly, uh, MR, because MR using the genetic variants as the instrument to check the effect of exposure and outcomes, usually the genetic variants can only explain a part of the variance of your exposure. Um, that's kind of led to the low statistical power of uh, MR approach. In conclusion, we identified genetic determinants for circulating metabolites, and we also inferred the causal effect of metabolite levels and ratios on 12 traits and diseases that are predominantly influenced by different mechanisms like aging, metabolism, and immune response. And um, I would like to thank uh, all the lab members from uh, Dr. Brent Retcher's group, Dr. Silas group, and also the collaborators that contribute to this research and also the funding um, uh, agencies and also the COSA for sharing this data with research community. And uh, thank you for listening. Hey, thank you, uh, Yi Heng, for your excellent presentation. Um, I think you did a great mm -hmm. job at taking a very complicated topic and uh, and making it very accessible. So I would now like to open it up for questions. So just a reminder, muting will remain on, but you can enter your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. I see a few questions have come in. Okay, so I will start with the first question from Yisheng Chow. Thank you for the great presentation. Did you find the significance of any locus uh, metabolite associations different from that reported in the literature? So for example, the significant association between metabolite A and locus B was reported insignificant in a previous study. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, but the reason why they are not significant, it could be due to many different reasons, right? For example, there could be uh, because the sample size, um, that's kind of one uh, major difference. Also, sometimes the technique they used to measure the metabolites could also uh, limit how um, sensitive, how accurate you measure the metabolites. Okay, great. So the next question from Andrew Patterson. Thanks for a great presentation. In your Manhattan plot, I didn't see any results for the X or Y chromosomes. Yes, that's a good point. Um, so uh, first, I think for SLSA, we, uh, we do have X chromosome, but at the time, um, we did not uh, specifically perform uh, X chromosome analysis because X chromosome is a uh, it's a very uh, complex um, topic because the, um, sorry, I think there's um, uh, the, the silencing because the, uh, sorry, uh, the silencing sometimes is incomplete. So how to model the variant association with the metabolites sometimes is tricky. So at the time, we want to focus on autosomes first, but definitely X chromosome should be studied um, for uh, to check their association with the metabolites, especially uh, should be in investigating, uh, you know, six specific design. Okay, great. Uh, so another question from Andrew Patterson. Uh, statistically, is there a difference between using the metabolite ratio as opposed to co-varying one metabolite for the other one? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, 
I don't really understand what you mean by covariant. Uh, you mean uh, creating a new phenotype using instead of using ratio, but using some other statistical way to aggregate their levels. Um, yeah, I haven't explored that. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. That's okay. We'll see if he, uh, he can comment on the question if he wants to clarify. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Leela McKinnon writes, thanks for this great presentation. I thought your descriptions of the MR and GWAS methods were very clear and helped me understand them better. I have a very broad general question, which is what would you say the applications of this research are? What are some of the ways these findings could be used in a clinical setting? Yeah, that's a very good question. So as I mentioned, um, for the, uh, like the way the relative measurement from uh, metabolomics, we don't really know, uh, for example, um, which threshold we should set, you know, for, for example, for orotate should be labeled as, you know, high risk to, or to help us differentiate the high risk group for uh, people with, um, you know, osteoporosis. But um, at least we kind of prioritize some of those metabolite targets that, um, you know, the, and their association with diseases. And then maybe next study could be, uh, you know, get a, a smaller cohort, and then we can more accurately measure those metabolites, and then you know have a, then create a dosage um, dependent uh, association between the, the the absolute level of the metabolites and disease risk, and then in that case maybe we can generalize those threshold uh, for um, disease sc uh, risk screening. Um, etc. Or maybe the orotate actually, or the related genes can be used as a drug target. Um, so yeah, those kind of uh, a potential application for the findings. Okay, so I've got another question from Andrew Patterson. Did you analyze the unnamed metabolites? Wouldn't finding GWAS signals for them provide insight into the potential compounds slash roles? Yes, um, uh, thanks for your question. Yeah, I did. So basically for my um, uh, filtering step for uh, to to include metabolites, I didn't filter them based on whether they have no identity or not. Um, I do include all of when she was for all of them. Um, however, the, the tricky far, part for analyzing um, uh, unknown or, un, the, or for the metabolite without identity is that uh, you can find a strong association between this variant and the metabolites, but it's it kind of tricky um, to know whether that um, metabolites, like, are they, you know, the associations because of what, right? So, I mean, in my analysis, I, by integrating the biological uh, evidence, we kind of try to focus on those variant and metabolite association kind of supported by you know, expression or metabolic um, evidence. Um, but for those unknown metabolites, that part is kind of hard to uh, obtain. However, I do um, do know that if you find, you know, this genetic variant is kind of near a gene that of your interest, you can always go to the company and, um, you know, go to the, uh, and collaborate with them to further uh, identify those chemicals. And there's potential there. Okay, perfect. I think we have time for one last question, and we've got one last question in the Q&A. Um, hi, Yi Heng. Thanks for your work and presentation. This is from Stephanie Chevalier. Uh, can you provide some examples of energy metabolites which are not um, as obvious as others? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I I don't remember. I think the only one I remember, um, I think, is like phosphates. So somehow the... Um, uh, the they, they are grouped as um, energy substrates. Yeah. Okay. okay, perfect. Thank you very much again. Um, that was a wonderful presentation with lots of positive feedback. Um, so before we wrap up, I would just like to remind everyone that the next deadline for the data access, for the CLSA data access applications is April 10th. Um, so please visit the website under data access to review the available data. And we will also put a link in the chat. I'd also like everyone uh, to remind everyone to complete their anonymous survey upon exiting the Zoom session. 
Um, so if, yep, there comes the slide. Um, so our next webinar uh, will be factors associated with developing high nutrition risk data from the CLSA. This will be presented on Tuesday, March 19th at noon by Dr. Christine Mills of the University of Waterloo. Registration details um, are, will be available on our website um, and we'll also post the link in the chat box. And finally, remember that the CLSA promotes this webinar using the hashtag CLSA webinar. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at, um, at CLSA underscore ELCV. Great. Thanks again for, for joining us today.